Revelation chapter 3, we constantly turn to this passage, and the reason why is because we're covering that timeline in the church age as we go through world history, and that is the church age of Philadelphia. Now, why is it rightfully called the age of Philadelphia is as follows in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now, the reason why it is called the Age of Philadelphia, as we come across this timeline where you might recall the pilgrims have stepped in. Have, have, did they catch every sound so far? Did they record every sound? Okay. So... So as they landed in America, that's when the revival started to spread out. The gospel and the word of God spread like no other church age before. And I've given you the stories about the pilgrims and their landing and the early Baptists that came in. There is no doubt God's hand was about to do something in that country of America. There was absolutely no doubt about it. I mean, there were so many times the devil wanted to take that place for himself, but for some weird reason, Christian foundations always seem to uh, overcome, make a way, and come in. So that's why it's going to be very important to understand that this church age is uh, incredible and eye-opening and to pay attention to. So no one could stop it. This was the age of Philadelphia, what they called the Great Awakening Revivals. But to give a context, remember this, is that the devil, he was moving in. He tried to uh, grow his apostasy again. As you've noticed in nearly all the ages, uh, all the periods within our church history, is that when there's a revival or there's a great work of the Lord, it doesn't last forever. Mankind always go downhill. It doesn't go up. It doesn't get better and better. It always gets worse and worse. So during that time, the Great Awakenings, they received their revival. However, before it came into play, we have to understand the apostasy. And every time there's a revival, like I said before, there's an apostasy. So there was a time of apostasy. Pilgrims came in, the early Baptists flooded in, and there seems to be something where the Lord can work something great. However, apostasy grew where it started with the King Philip's War. And the King Philip's War, the white people, they, there was mistreatment toward the natives, and the natives also mistreated the whites. At the beginning, there was uh, there was a peace, there was some kind of relationship, communication, but it broke apart. And then King Philip's War came out, and then everything just crashed. In the end, however, uh, the people who instigated the King Philip's War, uh, they lost, and then the whites, they were able to continue colonizing and growing their civilization. And what happened after that then we get the Salem Witch Trials. That became a very infamous time throughout your history, and that's what the liberals want to park at. Now, it's very funny. They want to jump, like, decades later after the Pilgrim's Land and tell you what happened rather than telling you the specifics of what happened when they first landed. They don't tell you all of that. So they like to jump and shift time periods. That way they can uh, uh, paint a dark picture concerning Christianity. It's like as if 90% of your Christian life is good and there is that 10% or that 1% that's bad. The media and the public schools will park on that 1%, give you paragraph to chapters and chapters and pages long about that history and ignore the total 99% of the good. So that's what they've done. Besides, compare the numbers with Salem witch trials to the peaceful protests we had the last couple of years. 
I mean, that pales in comparison. Come on, man. I mean, come on. Uh, about 20 or less in the Salem witch trials, and they make a big deal and blame Christians, and then they don't look at their own hi hypocrisy, their own propaganda of what they did the past couple of years. So that's what's going on. The devil is trying to spread darkness again, trying to make sure that the Christians lose their foothold, their spiritual, uh, that spiritual thing that they're about to grow and be able to produce. The big thing that the devil sent out is called the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment is something that happened at France. If you recall, during the time when the King James Bible came out, England was opening its eyes to the truth, but then with that Anglican church and then that Calvinist influence, the Lord couldn't do any great work. Uh, Calvinism is always that thorn that ruins, that ruins uh, growth of Bible-believing truth. So what happens within the Anglican church, so I think we kind of noticed it, okay? Satan has his own, let me draw it out, that way it could be understood. It goes with Satan's religion and culture, okay? It starts out that way. So in this case, it's Roman Catholicism or the Anglican Church. Then what happens after that is Calvinism is mixed up with it. Once Calvinism gets messed up, then Bible-believing truth is tainted. From Satan's religion and culture, there's an awakening or Bible-believing truth. There is a Bible-believing ideology or belief or distinctive that we hold on to that comes out as a... As a as an attack, as a uh, counter-reaction, as a reaction against Satan's religion and culture. A lot of anger, a lot of oppression, a lot of darkness and slavery, and a demand for freedom and liberty according to uh, religious conscience, according to morals and principles. That's how our country was born as well. But besides, uh, I'm deviating right now. Point is, that's the Protestant Reformation. That's the birth of the country right here. Oh, everything. So a Bible-believing belief. But then Calvinism seeps in. Then when Calvinism seeps in, then what happens is this Bible-believing concept is poisoned. So once this thing poisons the Bible-believing concept right here, then it weakens. It weakens. Once it weakens, then it turns into apostasy. Then once it turns into apostasy, it, rever it reverts back to right here. So that's what you're going to notice. A lot of people will only see this, 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 and this. But uh, they forget this. This is a very important part of our history too. That's why I mentioned this bunch a lot. Why this is very important is these are the rascals, the scoundrel that ruin everything all the time. These guys, when they mingle with this, it weakens it. What produces is what is called orthodoxy, dead orthodoxy. Orthodoxy that's very dead. So that's why it weakens and then produces into apostasy. That's what happens when you mingle with this. Why? Because they make a big deal about education or culture. And you have to follow along our scholars. And then they get a lot of it involved into politics, in government. So when that mingles in right here, it just weakens down. Okay? If you notice our history, we don't join. We separate. That's a Bible-believing mentality. Even Martin Luther, even though... He wanted to reform the church, not separate from the church. Let's be honest. His actions caused a separation, which is why he's a very integral part of our Bible-believing history. His problem was he's just been mi mingled with this, right? So because of that, what happened, you can guess, in Germany and in Europe, th this Calvinist bunch produced a dead orthodoxy. 
The Puritan bunch produced a dead orthodoxy. So then the Bible believers, what we want to do when apostasy happens, you know what we do? If this Bible-believing belief is still around and they notice, hey, we're shrinking down here, we're not going to join this cycle. So what they do is that instead of going down here, they break apart here. They separate. I think you noticed that, right, in our history? That's why the Anabaptists, they separated. And they were persecuted by not just Satan's religion and culture, but their fellow Christians. And they even got burned at the stake for it, all right? You, you read and pray about that for a while, you, you holy Calvinist, you, you Puritan, pure Puritan, you. So we separate. That is our tendency as Bible believers. We always separate. That's how the pilgrims got into America, because they separated. And that's how the country was able to start successfully, because the separatists left that place. They became also known as pilgrim, these separatists. The Baptists had a mentality of separating. And we've seen that when the Puritans followed along, they always trail along these guys, see? So, it, so that's why we have to have a separation here. There, no conjoining, all right? We have to have that separation. They always poison us, okay? So once the separatists started something, Puritans came along, we can see that it's growing again. So then you get Roger Williams, who's really a separatist, separatist, so to speak. And then he's just, so rebel rogue that the Lord had to soften his heart. And then we get other Baptists who cause a conundrum. They weren't joining the pur puritanical influence. They were separated from that. They tried to separate themselves from that. So that's the important thing. Because of this Calvinism, this dead orthodoxy, Europe was heading downhill. So it fell apart. As it fell apart, you might recall from the history of the Thirty Years' War, the big influence is France, right? That's a major power. So in that major power, the devil, he always goes for the most powerful empire, if you notice that chain in our history. So he goes for the most powerful empire, and then it was Catholic France. So Rome was just losing its foothold. And I'll explain about those slippery snakes, why Rome is still the queen mother, though, okay? Even though they're not the, uh, the most powerful, they always survive in every top powerful pyramid of globalist or elite system. They are very persistent, okay? But France is tied with Catholic powers and atheism. That's a strong influence due to the Enlightenment. Because of the Enlightenment, remember that Catholic uh, monarchy system. So everybody wants to break free from that. But then when they want to break free from that Catholic dictatorship, in the end, they ended up uh, with this atheist propaganda stuff where it gave birth to a lot of socialism and even communism, believe it or not. That's how communism was born, thanks to the Enlightenment. So much death. You can notice their civilization was not successful in the Enlightenment, that kind of mentality. Equality, liberty, and freedom are not, listen up now, these are American concepts that are not biblical concepts. I know that might be shocking to you, but I'll explain that later on. When we talk about uh, liberty, freedom, it's under the dictates of the Bible. See, so whatever uh, we believe in the Word of God, we are free to believe in that. That's why Romans 14 is there. Romans 14, every man let them be persuaded freely in their own conscience as long as they follow the Bible. But when you're outside of the Bible and every human nature is free to do what they want, it's chaos and it's pure humanism and anarchy. It doesn't work. The Enlightenment was great evidence of that. And then uh, as we hit down to the French Revolution, that was the consequence from the Enlightenment. Okay, so... I will read it as follows. This is on Frederick Widdowson's book, page 290. Now we are going, uh, this is his book, A Bible, Believer's, uh, A Bible Believer Looks at World History. Now we are going to look at events which also help mold modern intellectual thought in this era. The next great humanistic revolution after the era known as the Renaissance is called the Enlightenment. Thomas Aquinas, the 13th century Catholic theologian who glorified the logic of Aristotle 
and helped integrate that pagan philosopher's thoughts into Catholic theology, was one of the early forerunners of both the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. The intellectual elite that were born of this movement believed that they could improve mankind's position by attacking Christianity, which they regarded as mere superstition and the hereditary aristocracy of Europe, which they regarded as tyranny. Both concepts holding back mankind's progress towards some eventual golden age. Europe had been ruled by the Roman Catholic Church and by an elite of nobles who owned great land and even small states themselves and passed them onto their offspring by inheritance, often viewing entire people groups as nothing more than a large private farm holding. One of the beliefs that kings held onto, such as King James I of England and Louis XIV, the so-called son king of France, was called the divine right of kings. This concept stated that kings ruled at God's command and under his authority and their power was not to be questioned by inferiors as the king was accountable only to God. There is much more to this ideal, but this simplistic explanation will help you understand the basic attitude. Now you'll notice that under England, with King James I and his followers, that's why the separatists left. And they're very different from what you're going to get from the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Very different. One was founded on Bible, other one is without Bible. And you see the fruits of both sides. It's always the Bible. When you're on the Christian side, you get fruit. When you do things your own way, you fall apart. He mentions right here uh, Galileo as one of the forerunners of the Enlightenment. Uh, a lot of you know he was the one who espoused the heliocentric view that the earth uh, uh, went around the sun. Michael de Montaigne argued that all morals are relative. Then you also get the two famous thinkers, Voltaire and Rousseau. They both challenged the aristocracy, denounced religion, all the while, while making a half-hearted attempt to stay within the good graces of the Catholic Church and the nobility that supported them. Now, if you know Voltaire, he's famous for a lot of atheist thinking. But you notice they still don't leave their Catholic ties. Why? Catholic Church still has its power. Catholic Church is a chameleon. It is not Christian. Do you understand that? They will work with atheists. They will work with anybody out there. And they have an infamous history of working with Nazis and sometimes the communists and everybody. That's the Catholic Church. All right, anyways, but we'll come to them as we read later on. There's a lot of interesting history about those Jesuits. Don't forget those guys. We'll come to them later. More to read here. The Enlightenment's inevitable result was the French Revolution where all religious faith was condemned as against reason. Of course, this supplanted one type of tyranny with another, just as atheistic religions like socialism and communism later would do by killing thousands and millions in the name of the best interests of human progress, rather than in the name of God. Still, a dead person is a dead person, regardless of the reason they were murdered. Another result of the Enlightenment was the advent of radical communistic belief and the idea that a perfect state could be created without God being a factor at all, utilizing only human reason. Tens of millions of graves in the 20th century proved the fallacy of that notion. The windbags of the Enlightenment produced so many volumes of writing that you could devote an entire course to just studying their work and many have. Of course, this only leads one back to Protagoras and his Man is the measure of all things nonsense. So during that time of the Enlightenment, and then we're going to later see the French Revolution, there's so much dark apostasy being produced, and that's the birthplace of a lot of your liberalism today, left-wing liberalism today. As a counterstrike from God to Satan's counter-reformation, remember the Jesuits planned their counter-reformation. They're planning their missions. And the Enlightenment... So we got France with their enlightenment, and then we got the Calvinistic influence spreading everywhere. And all they represent, we have an event called the Great Awakening. 
Some religious historians claim that the event called the Great Awakening was a series of revivals along the eastern seaboard of the American colonies that would one day be called the United States of America. There's no doubt. It, a lot of the Great Awakening is integrated with the birth of our nation. So, thus we begin. Thus we begin the story. A wonderful, uh, the Great Awakening revivals. During that time when Satan was trying to grow his apostasy again with the Salem witch trials and then King Philip's war and that puritanical influence, remember the danger of the Calvinist Puritan is what? Dead orthodoxy, right? What happens is the Bible believers see that, so what they do is that they counter, uh, they react toward this. Thank God not this one, they counteracted this one. Usually, now they call uh, me divisive, they call us divisive, but no, you're rescuing, you're doing a good thing for society if you react and criticize against this one first before this. If we get up to here, that's a long way to go. But if we get it up to here, then we can revive the dead Christians. All right, so don't criticize me when I kick the Christians and you go, oh, why are you unloving it? No, we got to awake out of our dead orthodoxy. All right? It's a good thing that I kicked them. This is from Dr. Upman's Church History Book, Volume 2, and page 32. The life histories of Whitfield and Wesley, both of them left autobio autobiographical accounts of their lives in journals, sound and read like the Acts of the Apostles. With the exception of the Jewish signs given to the Jews, because the Jews require a sign, the ministries of Whitfield and Wesley come as close to matching the work of the Apostle Paul as it is possible to come without the imprisonments. So John Wesley and George Whitfield are the two biggest names ever in this Great Awakening revival that you want to know about. Both men were stoned. Both men were attacked with whips and clubs. Both men caused riots where they preached. Both men preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And both men were so completely sold out to the preaching of the gospel that one often preached until his throat bled and the other, the other averaged 20 sermons a week for over 50 years. That puts me under conviction. I just whine about losing breath right here. My throat didn't bleed yet. Amen. Both men were street preachers and field preachers. One was in, this is important, one was an Arminian and the other was a moderate Calvinist. So John Wesley was the Arminian, remember from Jacob Arminius. We remember that. George Whitfield, he's known as a moderate Calvinist. Now, the reason why we can see here, it's kind of like Luther, okay? The big difference with uh, Luther and Whitfield is you can see some kind of Bible-believing practice or mentality in these men compared to the scholars like John Calvin and dead orthodoxy. Now, George Whitfield, he's such, a, he's such a rebel Calvinist, to be honest. He didn't follow really well with the Anglican church system. He was a rogue, and then even Puritans were baffled uh, by this guy. He's not your typical uh, Puritan or your normal Calvinist. This guy was unreal. Calvinists, if they want to brag about any of their Calvinist predecessors, they have to go to their preachers who have some kind of Baptist practice or thinking. You tell them that next time, okay? Spurgeon had altar calls. Paul Washer, don't believe in altar calls. And they want to brag about Spurgeon, Spurgeon, great guy, you know. George Whitfield, great guy, you know. Hey, these guys were the type that preached dramatically, and they yelled, and these Calvinists, they just bore you to death. John MacArthur is just so boring, man. How about that? See, there's a huge difference. When they brag about their Calvinist predecessors, just tell them this. It's because they acted like Baptists. You should act Baptist too. Tell them that. <laughs> Bodily manifestations rarely accompanied Whitfield's preaching. Although it was more eloquent and emotional than Wesley's, George Whitfield was stoned till bloody all over and nearly unconscious when he preached the gospel to a mob of papists in Dublin in 1757, Catholic Ireland. Wesley 
was burned in effigy at Cork. Sometimes Wesley preached for over two hours and then he was mobbed or stoned. He traveled more than 4,500 miles a year on horseback and preached more than 20,000 sermons to crowds of up to 18,000 people. Sometimes he began his day's work before five in the morning. George Whitfield was accused by an Anglican bishop of driving 15 people mad. Wesley's dearly beloved not only stole his private mail and forged his signature on papers, but she also dragged him around the house by his hair. That's John Wesley's wife. On several occasions, she stood up during his sermonizing and hollered that he was a hypocrite and that she had seen him drunk last night. Man, these guys were spiritually attacked. You can tell Satan really hated these guys. Wesley said simply, I did not dismiss her and I do not recall her. The Anglican church refused to give communion to Wesley's converts, but the impact of his ministry was so great that by the time of his death in 1791, he had 77,000 Methodists to whom give his own communion. <laughs> Among other things, John Wesley gave the impetus to the Sunday school movement, which became the greatest promotional and attendance checking branch of fundamentalism between 1930 and 2000. Robert Rakes, a Methodist, had opened a Sunday school class several years before the organized movement came. Would you believe that? It's a Methodist. That's where the independent fundamental Baptist church came from. It's not from Hiles, all right? It's not even with J. Frank Norris, it's uh, from the Methodists. A Methodist revival broke out in 1776 after John Wesley had left the States to return to England. So John Wesley, he ministered to America and England. And a convert of Wesley's, whose name is Nathaniel Gilbert, formed a Methodist society in the West Indies. Now, you might recall that's where those Moravian missionaries went to, sold themselves as slaves. So now the Methodists were able to follow along with the Moravians, which developed into a strong missionary field un under Thomas Koch and George Lyle. Wesley's parish was truly the world. You know what Wesley said? That's one of his famous quote. He said, my parish is the world. It's not restricted to a church building that, like the typical Anglican churches. You know, the Anglican churches, they didn't want Wesley, so Wesley went out, and he truly gained the whole world as a result. Nearly all of the historians agree that John Wesley was a great preacher and that he was a prime instrument in turning the English nation from a bloody revolution similar to the terrible catastrophe that befell Catholic France. See, that's why the Great Awakening Revival is so important. you got to realize, if it wasn't for the Great Awakening Revival, America would have fell in would have fallen into that uh, liberty, equality, fraternity garbage that was uh, without the Bible, without the Bible. But when America boasts about liberty, equality, and freedom and everything, they did it with the Bible. That's a huge difference. If they didn't have the Great Awakening revivals, America would have followed along France. You know what it takes? A, uh, you know what it takes? It just takes a few good men, as one song goes. That makes a huge difference. Sometimes, as you've heard Evangelist Calvin mention to us, maybe the reason why the, uh, the Bay Area didn't sink yet is because God has this handful here trying to do something. That's really huge, guys. That's really huge about these Great Awakening revivals, what they did. But having noticed this, the writers all contract typewriter, typewriter paralysis and failed to notice how John Wesley accomplished this. A terrible blindness suddenly descends on the church historians and secular historians, and they cannot get the pieces together with which they have to deal. You may as well face it. John Wesley saved England from a revolution by street preaching from a King James 1611 authorized version that was by his time nearly 120 years out of date. 
That's Dr. Upman's sarcasm and mockery of the so-called Christian, sophisticated, dead orthodoxy guys. That's something uh, big to consider. Now, the Great Awakening revivals, I mean, the Lord was doing uh, mighty movements uh, one by one. And he's, uh, he gave birth to so much, so much revival. And there are several other people that I'm going to name that uh, might be important for you to know. So several other people that you want to know within this Great Awakening revival. Uh, these sources, you can find it and dig it up yourself, but one of them is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was one of those first people who started the Great Awakening Revival. Jonathan Edwards, he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's a famous sermon. In that sermon, people, when they heard it, they slipped in their pews as if they were dropping to hell. And because of that, there was a huge Great Awakening Revival, and they even held an all-night prayer meeting. That's what the Lord mightily used. And then from Jonathan Edwards' descent in his family, you know how Princeton University started? Jonathan Edwards. Would you think about that? How about that from Jonathan Edwards' family? By the way, I went to Harvard. You're going to see Jonathan Edwards' name on one of the buildings. How about that? And a bunch of those liberal drunken idiots have no idea with that name behind their building. Not a clue. Not even Berkeley. Did they even dig up their scholar, George Berkeley? He was the one who gave that famous quote where it's a great, uh, where it's a great blessing. Uh, when I pray, I sin. Uh, goes like, uh, when I read the Bible, I sin. When I preach, I sin. My repentance needs repented of, to be repented of, and my tears need washing in the blood of Christ. In other words, he's talking about no matter how well he lives for the Lord, he still has that sinful nature. So then his own repentance needs to be repented of itself because any spiritual deed we do for the Lord can be mingled with something fleshly and sinful. That's convicting. That's what you're talking about, holy people. Oh, that's your UC Berkeley <laughs> name, prophet, founder. Wow. Yeah. And these guys smoke marijuana, drink themselves silly, completely left-wing socialist propaganda. Anyways, don't make me park there, all right? They don't study their history, these numbskulls. They don't study history, all right? So Jonathan Edwards started that out. His son-in-law was David Brainerd. This is the guy that had a burden for uh, being a missionary to the Indians. Now, David Brainerd, I think I'm spelling his last name right, okay? I'm not sure if it's an E or an A. But anyway, David Brainerd, he, he was a college student, went to Yale. But then instead of going into the world, he surrendered his life to Christ and became a missionary to the natives over there. It's one time recorded that he, this guy's prayer life is unreal. He would pray and there are accounts that the snow would just melt around him when he prayed. One time he prayed all night that he was sweating so profusely. It's not as much as great drops of blood as Jesus, but he sweated all over. And then he had a burden for these natives. And after praying all night, he just got up and these natives had their pagan celebration, their feast, and he just walked in. And the power of God fell on that place that the natives feared the Lord when they saw David Brainerd. He died young. He never got to marry his fiance. The fiance was the daughter of Jonathan Edwards. He was going to marry that family. But he died ever so young. And he died for the Lord that way. His diary is called David Brainerd's Diary. It's very famous, and Jonathan Wesley, uh, not Jonathan, John Wesley said no man should uh, ever read a book without ever reading David Brainerd's diary. So John, uh, John Wesley even recommended David Brainerd's diary. Another person, uh, the Lord was spreading revival after revival. We see David Brainerd, and then we're going to see other uh, people's names. We, uh, there were several people who became missionary to the natives, not just David Brainerd. Other people followed along David Brainerd's footsteps because of their burden for souls. You remember the Moravians who did their missions? Because of the Moravians' big influence, the Great Awakening people were, uh, bumping, uh, were bumping into that. And truly, what the seeds were planted from the Moravians and the Great Awakening revivals supported one another and produced fruits. 
The Moravians were already spreading out missionaries. Moravian mission missions was contemporary during the time of the Great Awakening revivals. So you got Nicholas, uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf who started it, and then he sent in the Moravian missions. Uh, you got Christian David and then all these other people. The Lord was just spreading revival. What a great uh, counter-reaction, that counter-attack, the counter-reformation, and the enlightenment that turned into the French Revolution. Isn't that amazing? That's all the Lord. That's all the mighty hand of God in between. Continuing on with uh, John Wesley and uh, George Whitfield, it's incredible. Dr. Uckman continues in page 36. How did these same educated idiots react to John Wesley in the 18th century? Watch out for the educated crowd. Always watch out for the seminaries, the scholars. And Bible believers, be careful when you get into that. Look, I'm not against in looking your best. And, you know, if you start a Bible institute to look your best and make it as prestigious as possible, but never, ever let higher education and culture influence that church and you weaken down your preaching and your people. Never! And it's turning into that. It's turning into that. Sad. Why? Uh, they want to be with their big peers. And then now you see these IFB pa pastors that they're peers with being peers with the Calvinists. You don't study history. I hope you don't see me as some kind of arrogant, angry thing, but this is my burden. Amen, Pastor. Because I don't want our fellow Bible believers to follow that mess. And it's sad how I see some of them doing that. It's sad. It's sad. Never, ever lose your foundation. We have always had that mentality of separating, of fighting resistance. If there's no fighting but settling down and getting along with each other, there's something wrong with you. The one we should settle down, get along with each other and grow is fellow Bible believers. But we can't keep holding hands with everybody that pretty soon we hold hands with watered down people. Then it goes to dead orthodoxy people. And then you get over here. Thank you. Now you better appreciate what I'm saying right here. You know uh, how the Lord can even use our ministry is because we're not conjoined with a bunch of the watered down people here. We were separated. And that's why a lot of people start to know our work in ministry. But if I can join myself with watered down people, and, and then what would happen? I wouldn't have this retaliation to really preach and teach and fight against this system. And a lot of people want to know about our ministry. A lot of people more know about our ministry because of that retaliation I have. All right, so you know how the educated idiots respond? Obvious what you hear. This is what they said about John Wesley, his peers, his educated peers, his prestigious peers. They talk about John Wesley's father. Samuel Wesley was a snob. That's what they say. John's preaching drew women by its appeal to their maternal instincts. He was an obsessional neurotic. You get that kind of accusation, right? Sensationalism, over-dramatizing in your preaching. No, no, no. It was said that John's methods appealed to the emotions, but that the, quote, educated membership of today refuses such high-pressure methods, end of quote. The educated class also felt that Whitfield was going too far in his preaching when it caused the theaters in Boston and Philadelphia to shut down. The educated class seemed to have a time of it, doesn't it? While the educated class was applying its own stupid standards of relativity to the King James Bible and the preaching of Wesley, it was recorded that he was a preacher of a low and moderate voice, a natural delivery, and without any bodily agitations or anything else in his manner to excite attention. Lawson says of Wesley that he always exercised the greatest care to have everything done decently and in order and to avoid all fleshy, fleshly excitement, delusions, and hallucinations. Yeah, don't our church do that too? Didn't your pastor right here had to like, hey, you know, we got to calm it down and we got, you know, your pastor has always done that, right? Why? It's important to have that. 
to not have that, you just go chaos. You go charismatic, actually. That's why the charismatics, they have no order, no system. They just went bonkers and the liberal news media crucified them because they just say stupid stuff. But, you know, uh, we don't want to go so far to this side, too, that everything is so done in such a prestigious thing that, uh, that we become dead orthodoxy. What the educated class called high-pressure methods and emotionalism was the work of the third person of the Godhead on Wesley's congregations. People often trembled and shook under his preaching, and many were even struck down. That's awesome, amen. So that was, uh, that's a lot about John Wesley. Let me read about uh, George Whitfield. So we're going to go to uh, How Satan Turned America Against God by uh, William Grady. That's his book. I'm going to read some uh, stuff. Now I hope that uh, you don't take this uh, discipleship class very lightly. It's very important. I had to dig up a lot of uh, Bible believers who gave the history, combine them together so that I can tell you how important this is for our history, for us today. This is found on page 130 for George Whitfield. On a balmy spring evening in 1738, a 23-year-old English missionary stepped foot on American soil at Savannah, Georgia. It was fitting that the date, May 7th, just happened to fall on a Sunday. The young man's name was George Whitfield. So see how the Lord was spreading revivals in America? William Grady continues on right here. As the despised Baptists lacked the political wherewithal to extricate themselves from their numerically superior oppressors, correct, remember the Baptists don't have that resources. Thank you very much. Oh, Gene Kim, why don't you do this? Partner up with this. And No, thank you very much. We've always been underestimated. We, we always lack the resources. The Lord, got the, last, the Lord got the last laugh by infiltrating Satan's line with a spirit-filled renegade Anglican, George Whitfield. Whitfield's philosophy of ministry was short and to the point. You notice how well he follows the established, prestigious, uh, orthodox church, Anglican church. Look, look at this. Speaking for God to an alien world, that's what George Whitfield said. And because he strove to be, quote, first a saint and then a scholar, end of quote, yeah, amen, yeah, amen, I better get an amen on that one. Schol schol uh, scholarship should always be last, never first. When you dump into scholarship first, you lose your spiritual walk and you get some kind of weird stuff in your head and then you become a dead orthodox person. A structure capable of accommodating his supernatural crowds could not be found on either side of the Atlantic. Whitfield, like his master before him, Jesus, was forced to preach in the open air. He said, quote, I thought it, I'm, it might be doing the service of my creator who had a mountain for his pulpit and the heavens for his sounding board and who, when his gospel was refused by the Jews, sent his servants into the highways and hedges. End of quote. As noted in the previous chapter, his numbers in Great Britain were staggering. 20,000 in the Moorfields, 50,000 at Kennington Common. Now remember, America didn't have a lot of people. So you got to realize that's huge. <laughs> Even just hearing the numbers now, that's really huge. 80,000 near Hyde Park. In 1742, Whitfield's throngs in... Cambus Lang, Scotland, approached 100,000. And all of this was being accomplished without the use of a microphone. Street preachers, get under conviction right here. And all of this was being, uh, the figures he attained in the lesser populated American colonies were not too shabby either. 6,000 in Germantown, 8,000 in New York City, 10,000 in White Clay Creek, 15,000 in Roxbury, 20,000 in Boston. His ministerial methods were often called into question by the Orthodox. Of course, it's always the numbskull Orthodox group. Once at the request of a condemned horse, uh, this is a good story. Once at the request of a condemned horse thief in New York, Whitfield accompanied him to the gallows, mounted his coffin, and promptly preached to several thousand stunned spectators. 
when a wimpy Boston minister met him with the words, I'm so sorry to see you here, George. You see that, you know, that Calvinist, that dead, you know, uh, that dead talk of the Orthodox group churches. I'm so sorry. You know, they always talk down on you when you're street preaching. You know what George Whitfield replied? Well, the guy said, I'm so sorry to see you here, George. And George Whitfield replied, so is the devil, you know, <laughs> and proceeded to address a throng of 20,000 on Boston Common. Mr. Whitfield sailed into Newport, Rhode Island on Sunday evening, September 14, 1740, for a three-day visit, intending to preach the gospel. He asked Reverend James Honeyman, the minister of the Church of England, for permission to use his pulpit. So the Church of England, right? You know what they think? Whitfield writes, At first he seemed a little unwilling and wished to know what extraordinary call I had to preach on weekdays, which he said was disorderly. I answered, St. Paul exhorted Timothy to be instant in season and out of season. As to an extraordinary call, I claimed none otherwise than the apostle's injunction. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. The pastor reluctantly agreed, whereupon Mr. Whitfield sent him into shock by packing out his 3,000-seat auditorium. George Whitfield writes, God assisted me much. I observed numbers affected and had great reason to believe the word of God had been sharper than a two-edged sword in some of the hearers' souls. End of quote. By Tuesday evening, there was so much Holy Ghost conviction on the town that a thousand souls besieged the private home where Whitfield was being entertained. Quote, I therefore stood upon the threshold and spake for near an hour on these words. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He observed, quote, it was a very solemn meeting. Glory be to God's great name. End of quote. While Mr. Whitfield would later conclude, quote, Rhode Island seems to be a place where much good may be done. End of quote. You know why. You remember what was at Rhode Island? Those Baptists. Those renegades, right? Those rebel rousers. Too much independent churches out there. The hireling honeyman murmured in a letter to an acquaintance Last Sunday arrived here from South Carolina, the noisy Mr. Whitfield. I shall endeavor to correct his mistakes and evince a just distinction betwixt Christianity and enthusiasm. Doesn't that sound like your typical deadbeat Calvinist, your Orthodox churches today? How about here? Now, you know what Whitfield gave the credit to? to why the cities were able to still have its freshness, its revival, and to keep going on? You know which denomination. The Baptists. So how about that from a Calvinist, huh? When's the last time a Calvinist gave us Baptist credit, huh? That we were the ones who held the fort, that held the last standard. No, they brag about their dead orthodoxy. Although Philadelphia was noted for its Quaker-inspired religious diversity, Whitfield pointed to a Baptist preacher as the city's true spiritual leader. The Anglican evangelist acknowledged, quote, I went and heard Mr. Jones, the Baptist minister, who preached the truth as it is in Jesus. He is the only preacher that I know of in Philadelphia who speaks feelingly and with authority. The poor people are much refreshed by him, and I trust the Lord will bless him more and more. Amen. So that is uh, a lot of things concerning about uh, George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield, he had a burden uh, for the South. When he went to the South, uh, actually, I got to read these parts a little bit. Uh, so when he went to the South, Believe it or not, what you hear about the Bible Belt, which is the South, it's not the Bible Belt, to be honest. Uh, in the South, it was so much full of apostasy. Uh, they were dead to the Great Awakening revivals. 
So George Whitfield, he mentions a couple things of the following. He cried out, stand, uh, standing in the pine thickets of North Carolina between Newborn Town and Trent River, he cried, Oh, that the Lord would send forth some who, like John the Baptist, might preach and baptize in the wilderness. I believe they would flock to him from all the country round about. He had a heavy burden for the Bible Belt because a lot of people were just uh, reluctant. Uh, they were closed-hearted to the gospel. As a matter of fact, George Whitfield mentioned there are several dancing masters, but scarcely one regular settled minister. And what he did was he went to a town. Now, this is pretty crazy. He went to a town and then he, you, you know from the word of God, if they don't listen to you, Jesus says, take off your shoes, get the dust off your feet, right? So George Whitfield realized he can't do a great work there. So he took off his shoes, rubbed the dust off his uh, off of his shoes and he said this town will never grow that's what he said when he left you know what happened to this day what happened was that town didn't grow it became abandoned that's what happened so that's what happened in the south there was nothing growing over there so it was the Lord's hand was clearly on George Whitfield these men really had the power of God when these people attacked or they tried to shut down these men of God's ministry, I mean, God was with them. God was with them. Don't make me put a curse on your town, all right? <laughs> you better thank the Lord. I still have enough love to stay here. Now, here are some other uh, interesting things that Dr. Upman wrote down. Page 37 in his church history book, the moderate Calvinist at this time was George Whitfield, perhaps the greatest orator among the preachers who ever lived. It was said that he could pronounce the word Mesopotamia with such pathos it would bring tears to your eyes. Benjamin Franklin paced Whitfield off one night while he was preaching in Boston Common, and Ben said that you could clearly hear every word Whitfield spoke from a mile away. In his outdoor services, the people sang the hymns of Charles Wesley until the music could be heard two miles away on a clear day. So George Whitfield and those people, and uh, they were singing Charles Wesley's hymns. Charles Wesley is the brother of John Wesley. You know those songs that we get excited in, the, in this modern era? This modern era and those archaic, outdated songs is where we still shout? run the aisles, throw the hymn books, and then, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears, the bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. That's Charles Wesley, the one that wrote, And can it be? that I should gain. That part. I woke, the dungeons flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. 1700s, outdated, <laughs> outdated. No one would sing and shout and dance to that music, huh? <laughs> Boy, you got it wrong. There was a lot of dancing. <laughs> There's a lot of dancing today. They take laps till they, uh, till they run out of breath, man. <laughs> That's the kind of church we are. <laughs> Let's see right here. Dr. Upman continues writing. It is probable, says Newman, that, quote, no evangelist ever surpassed Whitfield in power, to draw together and master great mixed assemblies. Naturally, the master of assemblies believed and preached only one Bible, an A.V. from 1611. It's that simple. Whitfield came to America in 1738 and moved up the coast of Georgia like a forest fire. The amen was heard for the first time in America in the congregation among the laymen, for some of you who didn't know. 
It's from those laymen. The Moravians had done their work well in 1732 and 1734, and the African slaves on the plantations in Georgia and South Carolina were prepared for the old black back 66 caliber English AV. Let's see right here. He preached in Philadelphia until the dancing schools, theaters, and concert rooms were closed as being, quote, inconsistent with the gospel, end of quote. Naturally, this was carrying things a bit too far for the educated class of Christians. Whitfield had preached to 15,000 on Boston Common. He had as many as 10,000 people profess faith in Christ at a single meeting. That is more than four times as many as professed faith in Christ on the day of Pentecost. No one in Whitfield's meetings ever spoke in tongues or ever talked to anyone who professed to have ever spoken in tongues. His main opposition came from the, guess who? The Christian faculty members of Yale, which, as anyone knows, was founded as a bastion of orthodoxy or fortress of faith. The students at Yale were warned against going to hear George preach because of his conduct and his enthusiasm. Where did you hear that from? Very similar, very similar to today. Now, this is great how George Whitfield died. George Whitfield died as he had lived, preaching full blast. The accounts indicate that while sick and dying, he preached to a large gathering outside of his bedchamber. Before he had finished, the candle which he had been holding was burnt to the socket. Retiring to his chamber, he fought for breath until at last he expired, and his pulse stopped forever. His last words were, Lord Jesus, I am weary in thy work, but not of thy work. If I have not yet finished my course, let me go and speak for thee once more in the fields. Seal the truth and come home to die. That's how he died. He died preaching. Amen. He died preaching. As a matter of fact, they buried him underneath his pulpit. You can go to that place today, and then they buried him underneath his pulpit. The last words that his Armenian fellow soldier, John Wesley, said before he died were, quote, this is what John Wesley said before he died. The best of all, God is with us. I'll praise, I'll praise, farewell. And that's how he died for the Lord. What a way to die. What a way to die. Very different. Very different from what you hear with today's so-called Christian preachers nowadays. Yeah. They don't have that fire. They lost it. Okay, unfortunately, I have to end it here. There's so much to read. There's so much to read. You remember John Clark, that early Baptist? Mm -hmm. Dr. Upman has some very interesting things to say about them. We're going to see how they're connected to the Vaudois of all engines. And then also, as I continue reading on, don't forget that Bible, uh, Bible belt in the South. It's not the Bible belt, but there was one person who changed it. Oh, yeah. We're going to continue on with the Great Awakening revivals. Amen. And then we're going to see that because of their influence, then the Baptists were able to co still continue on. The Baptists kept continuing on. And then as the Baptists continued on, then England was taking over more, and then they can see that a little bit more of that church-state thing was still in there. But as the Baptists were known for their independence, right, that independent mindset, their Baptist distinctives, what happened was when they were getting jailed or imprisoned for not following the, the state church, you know who were their lawyers? In comes in Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. James Madison. Wow. And you're going to hear what they said about those Baptists. Then came out when England was trying to take over the American Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be very surprised how these Baptists, because of their distinctives, how it gave birth to the American, how uh, the American Revolutionary people took their distinctives because of that. And then where you're going to see that Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and everything, you're going to find out how the devil tried to seep through 
in comes the Freemasons. And then uh, don't forget those globalist elites behind the scene. And then you're going to go back to the French Revolution. What were those Catholics doing? The Jesuits infiltrated somehow. The, the secret elites, secret societies were coming in. But then out of that constitution where most of it was nothing godly or biblical, there was that one line that remains, which is the first, which is the first, and that's the First Amendment. That was born from a Baptist distinctive. And we'll see if George Washington was Mason or Baptist. Next time, discipleship, all right? So there is so much gold mine here, all right? Father God, I pray that today's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers and that uh, everyone received a big blessing. Uh, help us never, never forget our history, Father. May we not repeat the sins of our forefathers. May we learn the good things of our forefathers. Keep pressing on for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.